Back at it with the Dr. React series. This week, I'm tackling scrubs. This show is supposed to be a comedy, but I've also heard that it's rated one of the most medically accurate shows out there. Let's find out. Lie number one, doctors don't wake up at 6 a.m. We wake up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. at the latest because usually we have patients scheduled for 6 a.m. or if we're gonna be on a hospital shift, you need to come in for rounding and pre-rounding. I don't know what kind of doctor this guy is, but 6 a.m. is a bit late. And four years of pre-med, four years of med school, and tons of unpaid loans have made me realize one thing. Good. Could you go drop an NG tube on the patient in 234 and call the attending if the lavage is positive? I don't know, Jack. Your first day in the hospital is a scary day. And I'm not talking about when you're a medical student on your clinical rotations, because no one really expects much from you when you're a medical student. When you go in as a resident, you're a doctor. You have a medical degree, so people have expectations that you'll know what you're doing. Now, just because you have the knowledge from a textbook on how to accomplish something, it doesn't mean that you have first-hand experience, and hands-on experience really matters, especially when dealing with other people because medicine is about dealing with people, not disease. The hospital doesn't want to be sued. <laughs> Being sued is not a good thing. Finally, doctors, if there is a mistake, don't admit it to the patient. Here's a fun fact about this. Common sense wise, you may think that, yes, if you hide the fact that you made a mistake, you're less likely to get sued. But what research has actually shown is that if you're honest and come clean about your mistake, which Doctors totally make mistakes, we're not robots. If you come clean about your mistakes and show the proactive steps you've taken to prevent that mistake from occurring again, patients are less likely to sue you. Patients' families are less likely to sue you. So it's about owning up, it's about being a good person, and if you're a human first, you're less likely to get sued. I'm a tool, I'm a tool, I'm a tool, 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 an unbelievably annoying tool. Yeah. Yeah, finally, these are your beepers. From now on, they control your entire life. <laughs> you would actually think that because it's 2018, or at least when I was doing residency, it was 2017, you wouldn't have beepers anymore. Guess what? We still have those same pagers. It's crazy. I actually had the communications people from the hospital send a message to my phone instead of to the pager, and I actually had them change that. To me, it just felt way too old school to be walking around with one of those pagers on me. You've done this to cadavers before, so this guy's alive. Just poke it through his skin. Poke it through. <laughs> Ow. Time's up. Carla, would you do it for him, please? I'm also gonna need an ABG. Why are you telling her? Shut up and watch. <laughs> okay, this is actually really funny. Very true that when you go in your first day, some of the senior doctors will wanna see your ability to do some of the procedures, like put an IV in, to do an ABG, which is an arterial blood gas. It's basically when you go into the artery, usually the radial artery, which is at the end of your wrist, it's one of the harder sticks because you can see veins. The artery, you actually have to feel the pulse and then insert the needle based on where you're feeling the pulse. Dr. Dorian, can you tell me what ailment most often I think I'm gonna love rounds. It's like being on a game show. What is uremia? That's my boy. This is a cool example of what rounds are. You basically have a list of patients that your team is responsible for and you go around with your entire team with the attending uh, being in charge. Sometimes it's the chief of medicine and you walk around to each patient's bedside and you discuss the case, not only with the patient, but with the team as well. Sometimes you get the doctor asking you questions. That's a form of pimping. They're trying to get you to think outside the box. The way that I like to lead rounds is sometimes we know already what the patient has because it's written on our reports, but I would say, well, what if this test came back negative? Or what if Mr. Johnson uh, presented without the headaches? What would change in your diagnoses? And that way it can facilitate how a person thinks because the quality of a good doctor is being able to adapt, is to be able to think on the spot. Back in the day, they were very mean about this pimping process, and if you didn't get it right, they would talk down to you, they would call you stupid. I don't see that negativity there anymore, and I think the whole process has become a lot more positive reinforcement based. I'm going for it. <clears throat> Infection? That's my girl. <laughs> Moving on. I knew the answer. I'm sure you did. <laughs> I was just frazzled. But how could you not you know what's Oh, saying. I know, yeah. Good. But thanks. If there's anything I can ever do for you, just... You could let me take you to dinner tomorrow night. We're back to the sex. Even a comedy medical show that is funny on its own still needs to have a little sex thrown in there. What the hell are you doing? All those newspapers are very legitimate. Like having a ton of newspapers just sprawled about that are very old, having that 
horrible TV that's like sitting way too high up so you have to jack your neck up. You daydream a lot, especially when you've been up for 24 hours. So that part of this is very realistic. Did you actually just page me to find out how much Tylenol to give to Mrs. Lentner? <laughs> I was worried that it could exacerbate the patient's. It's regular strength Tylenol. Here's what you do. Get her to open her mouth, take a handful, and throw it at her. Whatever sticks, that's the correct dosage. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest and say that I've done stuff like this. My first rotation going into residency was on the surgical unit, and I texted my senior residents or attendings for everything. And then after a few weeks, I realized like, why am I doing this? If I know it's the answer and I've double checked that it's the answer, why am I asking for permission when I have uh, a doctorate degree. So it takes some time to build up confidence. Not every person works at the same pace. So I totally get where he's coming from asking about the Tylenol. For the love of God, what? It's just, do we think we should be talking about them for her? She's dead. Oh my God. All right, this show's crazy. If they find out the nurses are doing your procedures for you, your ass will be kicked out of here so quick it'll make your head spin. Nurses uh, do the majority of the procedures as it is now. If the procedure is too difficult, you're the one that's responsible to come in and, and solve that problem. If then you can't do it, then you can escalate to either another resident or maybe the attending physician. But generally, nurses are better at doing the procedures than us because they do them so much more often, so their hands are much more well equipped to do the procedures. I'm not really dead. <laughs> this is such a wicked show. Let's go. <laughs> and like that, I was back in high school. You see, surgical interns, they're all slice them and dice them. They're the jocks. Medical interns, we're trained to think about the body, diagnose, test. The medical interns, well. You gotta stay. Ah! <laughs> We're the chess club. Uh, not exactly accurate, but has some truth behind it. Surgical uh, interns and residents are much more practical. They see a problem, they wanna fix it, they wanna go in and cut, reassemble, suture. Whereas as a medical intern or resident, you have to really think about, is this patient gonna follow the treatment? Is this medicine gonna interact with all these other medications? Sometimes surgery will consult us as the medical team to come in and manage something that's very simple for us, but to them, it's something that they don't do often. Whereas on the other hand, we'll call for their help on simple surgical procedures, even like sutures, if they get too complicated for us. It's really about teamwork and making it uh, a balanced approach. My first code. See, here's how it works. Someone's heart fails, they beep everyone. The first doctor in has to run the room, tell everyone what to do, basically decide if the patient lives or dies. What, am I crazy? In general, you have a code team that's said to respond to these code blues. Yes, it's about who gets there first, but it's not about any doctor in the hospital should just run up and start treating the patient. We have teams dedicated for this. Because imagine if everyone's busy and no one responds, what, the person just ends up dying? Not the case. There's strict responsibilities here. In my hospital, the way it worked was the ICU on call teams usually ran the code. And if there was something else going on, then the medical team came in and ran the code. Not gonna lie, it was scary when you would have one code and then another code hype, uh, happened simultaneously and then maybe a rapid response, meaning that someone's heart didn't stop but something serious is happening where their heart may stop soon. And at the same time, you get an admission. It can get really hectic. Hey, champ. First night on call will start soon, huh? Yeah, she must be excited. Ah! You betcha. The first night I was on call, I was terrified. Because you have one senior attending, and if they get busy with something, it's all on you, and you're so worried about making the wrong decision. But if you double check everything that you do, speak to people who have more experience than you when you aren't sure about what to do, you're gonna be fine. While those nerves are totally normal and expected, there are ways to combat it by being informed, by being knowledgeable, and by being smart. <laughs> I can relate to the feeling of like coming on call and instantly getting things to do. For me, my call started at 7 p.m. So when I would go at, in at 7 p.m., the team that's coming off would hand off to the pager to me and say, hey, we were so behind that there's still three or four admissions that are in the emergency room that need to be done and brought into the hospital. So you come in and you already have stuff to do. And then on top of that, you're getting pages about new things that are going on. The attending thinks it was a pulmonary embolism. No way anyone could have caught it. Anyhow, you have to pronounce it. Why didn't anybody page me? 
Could you just pronounce him so I can go home? Okay, so this is an interesting thing. Pronouncing someone dead is usually done by the on-call resident, so that's accurate. What happens is if a person dies in the hospital, the nurse pages the on-call resident, they have to do a full exam. We look at the pupillary response, pain threshold. We put a, a pen on the nail bed and we press very heavily so if the patient is somehow not dead, they would wake up. We listen to the heart, we listen to the lungs for extended period of time. There's like this whole physical exam that we do. And then uh, we write it a long note calling the time of death, suspected cause of death. In addition to that, once you pronounce the patient, you have to talk to the family, which is a very difficult conversation. You mature very quickly during these moments. Even now, when I finally get to go home, in the back of my head, I'll know the hospital's still here, wide awake. That line is very true. There's been times like I was in a good mood to go home and I was like, let me just stroll through the ER and something happened and I needed to help someone out and I end up staying three, four, five hours past my shift. It's like one of those things, go home while you still can because you need to be back back here the next night to save lives. The most important thing is that I got through my first three days without looking like a complete idiot. Another episode of the Dr. React series is in the books. Mixed feelings on this one, and that's surprising because I thought I would find it really funny. There was definitely parts that had me laughing and I was like, yeah, that's so true. But I don't know, some parts are just so dark and mean-spirited that I couldn't get behind it. It pushes a lot of the stereotypes on the medical community that aren't good to be pushed and we should be getting rid of them instead of celebrating them. I probably need to watch more episodes to truly understand what the characters are all about. If you like this type of content, please subscribe down below because it tells YouTube that you really enjoy this content and it allows me to continue making this type of content. And if you have a show that you love or specific episodes of the Scrub series that you want me to watch, leave it down below in the comments. As you know, I react to the comments all the time, if not in the comment section, in my monthly responding to comments video. As always, stay happy and healthy. Happy.